Hello, everyone. I um, wanted to give you the option of viewing the direct instruction piece for minerals um, uh, electronically by me narrating. So it typically take about an hour to do this, but um, I'm going to try to condense that down as much as possible. Um, and you'll have the ability to pause and rewind and do whatever you need to. So this is just a general introduction um, into geology and specifically minerals. Uh, we're going to be looking at the definition of a mineral uh, the characteristics, how the, how are they identified, what are some special properties that we use um, to identify those minerals. So let's go ahead and get to it. Uh, so we started with the four branches of our science of meteorology, astronomy, geology, and oceanography. Uh, we, from there, we delved into the systems of our science, the hydrosphere, biosphere, atmosphere, and geosphere. So um, we're sticking with geology now. We're kind of working our way into that, but of course, don't forget about the systems and their interactions. Uh, but geology is basically the study of the Earth, its surface, and its interior. So some of the topics in geology, um, and these are all things that we're going to study. Um, first off is minerals, and then we'll move into rocks and look at the distinction between those. Um, we'll look at the rock record um, and what that tells us about the Earth's history or geologic time. And we'll also look at how the Virginia provinces were formed um, through different interactions. So we'll look at um, kind of a time scale process of how Virginia got to be the way that it is. Uh, when we get into dynamic earth, we'll be looking at some of the more dynamic processes, um, things like earthquakes, volcanoes, and plate tectonics or the shifting of the Earth's crust. Weathering and erosion, um, we'll look at how things, how landforms change over time through different processes, through different uh, things like glaciers um, and rivers, and be able to distinguish between um, between those two and actually look at different areas and see how each one was created. Um, we'll also look at winds, waves, uh, groundwater, how all those uh, affect different landforms. And then the last one, uh, last piece that we'll kind of cover as we move through are different resources, especially those found in Virginia um, and energy. So the organization of matter, I always like to start here because uh, you come with a lot of background knowledge. So um, when we talk about geology, we're looking at the solid matter of the earth. Um, and so you kind of break it from atoms and atoms, of course, can uh, come into individual elements like hydrogen, helium, lithium, so on and so forth. Um, on through those elements can combine to make compounds. Um, and those compounds can form naturally um, into minerals, and then the minerals will combine into rocks. So that's kind of the organization or flow that we're looking at. We're going to be looking at the minerals first and then look at how those minerals combine to make different rocks. Where do we find minerals? Well, we find them everywhere, literally in everywhere. Every setting, every place you go, you will find examples of minerals from your bathroom. Um, and you're, feel free to pause and look at all these examples, but in your bathroom, from porcelain in the sink and the toilet, um, even to the minerals in your toothpaste, to the kitchen, um, your cookware, your dinnerware, um, table salt, of course. Um, to your office, there's minerals in the glass of your um, Chromebook or computer screen, in your cell phone, um, in the rolly chair, the computers, um, lots of metals and things like that. So all of those came from minerals. And then, of course, outside the home with all, all the metals, the brick, uh, glass, all of those are derived from minerals. So here's the question, and you kind of gone through this already hopefully before, but uh, we're the, full, the most prevalent or abundant elements in the, for example, universe, Trent, that is hydrogen and helium. Those are the two most plentiful, make up, I think it's 97% of all the matter in the universe. In the atmosphere, the two most common elements are um, oxygen and nitrogen, nitrogen being the most at about 78%, um, and then oxygen right behind there at about 23%. The biosphere is carbon and oxygen. So um, all living creatures on Earth are based on the element carbon, um, and then oxygen is a pretty unstable element, but it uh, turns out it does a great job as far as binding things together. In the hydrosphere, this one makes perfect sense, um, hydrogen and oxygen, components of water. Now the geosphere is a little tougher. So in the geosphere, the two most common elements that we look at are in the crust, 
and those are actually silicon and oxygen. Um, sand and, um, is a great example just because sand is primarily made of uh, a mineral called silica, and silica is just SiO2. It's two oxygen atoms surrounding a silicon atom, and uh, it's extremely common, makes up most of what you see on the beach, um, and it is the two most common elements in the geosphere, at least in the crust. The other ones followed by that are aluminum, iron, calcium, magnesium, sodium, uh, and potassium. So they're much smaller concentrations, but again, the two most prevalent in the crust are silicon and oxygen. So what is a mineral? Uh, and again, hopefully you've already had some practice here. Well, we have a very formal definition of what a mineral is. It has to match very specific criteria. And here it is. A mineral is a naturally occurring inorganic solid with definite chemical composition, crystalline structure, and unique physical properties. So five different things make a mineral. Uh, naturally occurring, inorganic, solid, definite chemical composition, crystalline structure, and unique physical properties. Well, if that's a mineral, what's a rock? Well, a rock is basically a mixture of different minerals. Sometimes you can see that mixture with your eyes, like in the example of granite. Sometimes it's harder to see. Um, sometimes in a rock, you're not able to identify the individual minerals, but in a lot of rocks, especially in um, igneous rocks that form from magma, where they cool very slowly and the crystals from the minerals can precipitate out, um, you can really see the minerals, but a rock is nothing more than a combination of minerals. So we're going to break it down um, and go into some specifics on each one. So mineral has to be naturally occurring. In other words, it cannot be man-made. It cannot be uh, made in a lab or made by people. We can emulate a lot of minerals, even diamond, we can create in labs, but to be a mineral, it has to be naturally occurring. Um, it has to be inorganic, which means it cannot come from any living thing. This one's kind of confusing because um, you can have organic rocks, but they are not considered minerals. Um, so for example, um, calcite is a naturally occurring mineral, uh, but it's organic form um, that can even comprise limestone is not a mineral. So um, it has to be inorganic or not coming from living things. It has to have a definite chemical composition. It has to have a unique chemical formula. In other words, um, for example, quartz, SiO2, um, gold, just AU, um, and then orthoclase it has potassium, aluminum, silicon, and oxygen. So every mineral has a definite chemical composition. All minerals have a definite crystalline structure, even if you can't see it. Uh, you may have to look at look at them under a microscope. But a crystalline structure means just the atoms repeat over and over in definite proportions. Um, you can really see it under a microscope, for example, in like halite, table salt, a nice cubit pattern. Quartz, if it forms slowly enough, will have a, a really neat uh, hexagonal shape, but terminates in a, um, uh, like a tetrahedral, like a pyramidal shape. It's really neat. But all minerals have a definite crystalline shape. It's a repetitive geometric pattern. All minerals have to be solid as well. Um, they cannot be liquids or gases at room temperature. All right, uh, some unique properties of minerals. All minerals have unique physical properties, including color, um, smell, like sulfur, stinks, um, taste, like halite, salty. Um, but some of the other properties that we're going to be looking at how to test for, uh, of course, color streak. It's color on a streak plate. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Hardness, um, how hard it is. Again, there's a, a kind of a fun test for that. Uh, luster, how it reflects light. How does it break? Does it cleave nice or does it just fall to pieces? Um, its density is a really good identifier. Um, and then any kind of special properties, like I said, smell, magnetism, um, and reacts with acid. So those are all unique properties and every mineral has its own unique set of properties. Special note on density. Um, the formula for calculating density is um, mass divided by volume. So um, it's really one of the best ways to determine or identify minerals because each mineral, because it has a unique chemical composition, um, it will generally have a very specific density. Um, it's an easy way to tell uh, if 
one mineral from another. For example, you see in a lot of movies where people are just carrying duffel bags full of gold. Totally incorrect. Um, each one of those bricks is a, is a lot of mass in a very small volume. Dense is a very, um, excuse me, gold is a very dense mineral. So um, to calculate the density of an object, mass divided by volume is a very good identifier. Why is color not a good indicator? So um, color can help you determine what a mineral is or rule other minerals out, but in and of itself, color is not a very good indicator. Now, sometimes you may have a mineral that's like bright yellow. You can almost tell you it's going to be sulfur. But look at these. These are all crystals. They're all clear, but they're all different minerals. One of these is worth a lot of money. The rest of them are worth any, hardly anything. Can you tell? If you guess the first one, you guess correctly. That's diamond. Um, but the same mineral, uh, different minerals can have, of course, similar colors, but the vice versa of that is um, the same mineral can actually come in different colors. For example, quartz. Quartz can come clear, just like the, the second picture you see. Um, it can come smoky, kind of a grayish color, rose colored um, quartz. Uh, it could have uh, even a blue, an amethyst. So um, the same mineral can come in different colors due to slight variations in its um, uh, chemical composition. Uh, it's all SiO2 for quartz, but every once in a while there may be an atom of some other element thrown in that can cause coloration. Diamonds are the same way. You have clear diamonds, brown diamonds, uh, red diamonds, like blue diamonds, like the hope diamond. So color is, can throw you off at times, but it can help narrow it down. Streak. Now, streak is um, the color of the powdered form of the mineral, and we typically do this on a streak test. The streak test is you have this um, unglazed porcelain tile, and you just take the mineral and you rub it against it. Um, the color that's left behind is its streak. Um, it can really help you out, uh, again, kind of like color to help you narrow down what the mineral may be. Um, if you'll go to the slideshow in the uh, in the folder there, you can watch the little video that shows you how to perform the streak test. The streak test, again, can help narrow things down. Um, for example, let's say you have two gold-looking minerals. One of them might be gold, one of them might not be. So you could look at the density of the mineral, but you could also perform a quick streak test. Um, in this example, I have pyrite and gold. Pyrite has a brownish or greenish colored streak. Um, pyrite is called fool's gold. It's basically worthless. Um, but gold has a golden streak. So not only can the density um, help you with that, but also the streak test. Mohs hardness scale. Uh, Mohs hardness scale is a measure of a mineral's ability to resist scratching. And it goes from one to 10. It's a very simple scale. Um, and you can see in the slide here that some very common objects have some predetermined hardnesses. For example, fingernail is about a 2.5 on this scale. So anything that has a hardness below a 2.5 will not scratch your nail. Anything above a 2.5 will. Uh, copper penny of 3.5, uh, knife or glass plate is about a 5.5, steel nails about a 6, masonry bit is about an 8.5. So um, there are some examples of scales 1 through 10, uh, different minerals. The softest mineral is talc. Anything can scratch talc. Um, it's used to make baby powder, so very soft mineral. You can scratch it with your fingernail. All the way up to number 10, which is diamond. Nothing scratches a diamond as far as minerals go. Uh, no other mineral can scratch a diamond except for another diamond. To perform a scratch test, you can use those common items, see which one scratches which, um, and kind of narrow it down. Again, to identify these minerals, um, you can perform these different tests to be able to figure out what they are. And it's just another tool in your toolbox. I included a logic puzzle um, to see if you can narrow down um, 10 different minerals using these clues. Um, feel free to work on that. Uh, I'll include the, um, the key for that at the end of the presentation. So another physical property of a mineral is luster. Luster is how light is reflected off the surface. The surface. Um, you can break it down into two main types, metallic versus non-metallic. 
And then um, from, especially with the non-metallic, you can go into lots of different um, variations, uh, like glassy, uh, pearly, uh, iridescent. Um, there's a reinforcement link for you in the slideshow if you like, but uh, we break it down into metallic versus non-metallic, and then from the non-metallics, we can go from there. Cleavage versus fracture. This is actually a pretty fun one. Um, cleavage versus fracture refers to when you hit the mineral, how does it break? Um, so for example, some minerals like halite or calcite, when you hit them, they actually cleave along smooth planes, and I included uh, a couple of videos in the slideshow. Um, they cleave nearly perfectly, a nice smooth break. Um, especially with calcite, you crack it or you break it, it actually breaks into just smaller versions. It's really neat. This is versus the idea of fracture. Fracture means that the mineral just breaks. It comes apart um, into curved or irregular pieces. Crystalline structure, of course, can help you identify a mineral. Every mineral has to have a definite crystalline structure, so you can use that crystalline structure to help you identify it. Um, conditions such as pressure and temperature are going to affect how they grow and how easily they're seen. Um, and I'll show you an example. You look at this image up at the top, and there's a video that accompanies, accompanies it. Um, so the mineral crystals that you see are something called selenite. Um, they're actually a very, very common mineral, um, but it was the conditions. This cave was actually submerged in very, very warm, very uh, water for a very long time. Um, and so because it was so warm, the crystals precipitated out of um, that groundwater very, very slowly. And they were given the time to align themselves uh, nice and regularly, such that you have this huge uh, structure that you see here. Some other properties that we can use to identify minerals, um, fluorescence, um, if they glow up under ultraviolet light, Chemical reactions are a nice one if it fizzes under acid. Um, some minerals have optical properties. Uh, for example, with calcite, you can actually see two images if you look through it on the sheet of paper. Magnetism, taste, and even radioactivity, they can all help you determine what the mineral is. Again, fluorescence or uh, phosphorescence um, emits light or reflects light uh, under UV conditions. Uh, Here's a picture there to illustrate that. This effect that you see here is called chatoyancy or the cat's eye effect. Um, some minerals do have this and of course it can help you identify. This is called iridescence. Um, it's where it gives off a uh, rainbow effect. Um, the mineral on the right hand side there is called bismuth. Uh, that was actually created in a lab to precipitate out very nicely because bismuth usually combines with other materials pretty rapidly. Um, but iridescence, it's uh, again, just another trick in your toolbox to be able to identify a mineral. We have two main groups of minerals that we're going to be talking about. The silicates, which contain SiO2 as part of their chemical makeup. And I've shown you some examples here, quartz being the main one. Um, and then the non-silicates. And from the non-silicates, we can break them down into much smaller groups, and we'll do that at a later time. Um, but for now, just know that we can group minerals into two main categories based on the chemical makeup. All right, last little bit. Um, ores and gems. So a mineral can be just a mineral, or we can subclassify it as an ore or a gem. And it's really simple. We consider a mineral an ore if it gives us something useful. For example, hematite uh, is an iron ore. You can see in the picture there, it's kind of rusty colored. Uh, that's from the iron oxide that builds up. Um, malachite is a copper ore. Galena is a really dense mineral. Um, it's a lead ore. So uh, lots of lead, actually, it's lead and sulfur. Um, and then gold. Even gold can be considered an ore, um, often contained in quartz. So if it gives you something useful, it's an ore. If you can cut and polish the mineral, then we consider it a gem. Um, so things like diamond, you saw the picture earlier of the diamond. Um, you can cut and polish that and it will reflect light. And be, it's just, they're pretty. Um, they can also be valued for their hardness, um, such as topaz, which is a very hard mineral. 
um, and of course diamond. But if it's uh, prized for beauty, it can be cut and polished, and it's typically usually pretty hard minerals. Uh, we consider them as gemstones. That's all that I have for uh, the mineral um, mineral direct instruction. Again, please make sure that you go through the actual slideshow. Um, there's lots of little videos and clips in there uh, for you to review and some other websites that you can go to. You can also uh, look at the reinforcement from the CK12 um, the CK12 readings, and I think it has several practice pieces. As always, if you have any questions, please let me know, um, and I'll be glad to help you out any way I can.